Good afternoon. My name is Miriam Aliso, and I would like to welcome you to today's webinar, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau Resources for Parent Centers. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. To the right of the GoToWebinar PowerPoint viewer is the GoToWebinar control panel. This is where you have the option to select the way you hear the webinar, raise your hand, and ask questions by text. You have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presentation by typing your questions into the questions for staff pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation, and we will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. You can also download the webinar uh, and PowerPoint and a couple of um, handouts too. They are on the GoToWebinar control panel. You will notice on your screen a screenshot of an example of the GoToWebinar interface. You should see something that looks like this on your computer desktop in the upper right corner. You are listening in using your computer system by default. If you prefer to join over the phone, just select telephone in the audio pane and dial in information will be displayed. Be sure to put in your unique pin. Also, the control panel will collapse automatically when not in use. To keep it open, click the view menu and uncheck auto hide control panel. Today's presentation will be recorded and will be available on the Zipper website. Hi, this Hi, is Deborah. Deborah Jennings, and I'm from the Center for Parent Information and Resources, where I'm the, the director. And I also want to welcome our Parent Center Network to this special uh, webinar presentation on building your children's financial future, building your financial capabilities and money man and providing you with lots of resources for money management tools, planning for college, paying for college, um, for not just um, parent center staff, but for parent center to staff to share with families. So I'm going to turn it over to Carmen Sanchez, who will introduce our presenters and our rationale for this particular offering for the parent centers. Hi, everyone. Um, you all know me. I'm Carmen Sanchez. I'm the parent program um, lead at the U.S. Department of Education. Um, so welcome to this webinar. This webinar came about uh, because I'm on a uh, one of the federal uh, representatives on the group for supporting grandparents raising grandchildren uh, act and in there i met um, a colleague of our presenters today uh, there at the um, at the consumer financial um, of the cvpb um, organization and we talked about the kinds of resources that are available through that the federal resources that are available to help people be financially healthy to let them know about their financial rights and I thought that was something that can really be added to the toolbox of the work that you do when you discuss families and you work with families in order to ensure that their long-term health and also as you work with youth because they have a lot of materials that are specifically geared towards the young consumers so we thought that this would be a wonderful addition to your toolbox of everything that you do and that you can then refer back to it and know that they're vetted and that they're federal resources and they're they're strongly needed. Um, we started to work on this before the pandemic hit, but ever since the pandemic hit, um, this has become even more important for people to be as educated as they can about their rights and about their financial health. So without turning, uh, further ado, I'm going to turn it over to the uh, four presenters, to Lynn, Caitlin, Kate, and Jill. And they will then introduce themselves and their roles and the resources that are available to you. Thank you so much.
Next slide. Thank you. Um, I'm Lynn Harrelson. I am with the section for uh, financial education at the office um, at the CFPB. Um, this is our disclaimer that basically says this presentation is being made um, somewhat, somewhat live um, and does not constitute legal interpretation, guidance, um, any opinions or views, and we won't be um, sticking to a script uh, that we will will be presenting uh, this. So um, next slide, please. So the Bureau's mission and vision is, the mission is to regulate the offering and provision of consumer financial products or services under the federal consumer financial laws, which we consolidated from another number of agencies when the CFPB was created. This component is what we're gonna talk, this next component is what we're gonna talk about today. And it's to educate and empower consumers to make better informed financial decisions. Um, our vision is free, innovative, competitive, transparent consumer finance markets where all the rights of all parties are protected by the rule of law and where consumers are free to choose the products and services that best fit their individual needs. Next slide, please. What is financial well-being? Next slide, please. Financial well-being is something that we base all of our materials on. We also, I want to point out, write all of our materials in plain language. Um, you're not going to find a lot of legal ease or confusing. Um, we're going to break it down to as, as, as um, common language as we possibly can. So financial well-being is a state of being where, and essentially in your current and ongoing financial matters, you're able to really meet your financial needs, uh, both now and in the future. Uh, and you're able to make choices that allow you to enjoy life. It's not what you about what you earn. It's about how the decisions you make with the money you have um, that allow you to have peace of mind. That's very different than financial capability, where we're really focused on building your knowledge, your skills, and your access to manage financial resources effectively. Next slide, please. <clears throat> There are four elements of financial well-being that we have established at the Bureau. The Bureau created these uh, consumer-driven definitions of personal financial well-being for adults. Our research suggests that there, these four elements are of, for, for financial well-being. Um, security and freedom of choice, and then present and future. So we control of our day-to-day, month-to-month finances, we're able to absorb a shock, which um, I think all of us have, have probably experienced recently. Financial freedom to make choices to enjoy life, and you're on track to meet your financial goals. Next slide, please. This translates into our youth financial capability. And there are three building blocks of youth financial capability. And they occur in early childhood, middle childhood, and adolescence and young adulthood. In the early childhood, we're focused, as you can see, primarily on executive function. Uh, executive function builds throughout our life. However, it starts, our prime time to start building it is in early childhood. And that is focus on a situation, um, be able to to do some uh, delayed gratification. Um, I think we all know about the marshmallow test uh, where kids are given a marshmallow and if they don't eat it right away, they get a second marshmallow. All of those things, setting goals can be started as early as three years old. In our middle childhood, we're looking, um, we start looking external to ourselves. Um, that's when peer pressure comes in. That's when we start developing financial habits and norms. And at this point, it's very important um, that children are able to focus across the spectrum and really begin to find those shortcuts, those healthy money habits, those rules of thumb that they will use throughout their lifetime. 
And then as we get to adolescence and young adulthood, financial knowledge and decision-making skills, um, really honing in on finding the correct factual knowledge, um, doing your research, doing your analysis, really putting a plan in place before you make any, any uh, financial decisions. At this point, what we're really wanting is to build those basic money skills and also, if possible, allow children to test out uh, in a safe environment under the, under the purview and under the, the guidance of an of a adult. Next slide, please. Our CFPB Youth Financial Education Resources follow this track and our, our young children, school-aged teens, uh, and teens to young adults. Next slide. We have a resource for parents and caregivers because we also realize um, parents are the number one resource that children look to um, as they begin to build on all their habits and norms. Um, this resource is for parents and caregivers. And the reason we say caregivers, because we understand um, there are many forms of non-traditional uh, care out there, as well as grandparents, um, that are influencing um, their grandchildren. Again, this is developed along the three building blocks, um, executive function, building money habits. Under developing executive function, uh, we have resources that make it easy for parents and caregivers to find tools, activities. Um, under building money habits and values, new home for the popular money as you grow website. And then practicing many skills and decision make, making skills. We have a number of resources on blog and blog posts, social media, emails that we generate to help um, in those in that particular area. Next slide. Okay. Money as you grow bookshelf and parent guides. Money as you grow bookshelf um, essentially has the story. It has some ideas in the story. It gives you something to think about. You, a parent or caregiver should read these before they read the book to the child. Um, it gives you something to talk about past the reading of the book. Um, and it gives us something um, that is very age specific that the child can do. Next. We have 20, next slide. Um, the, we have 21 books in that series and here they are. You will notice that they're not all um, they're not geared towards um, all financial topics. They're more on building the executive function, building the habits and norms. Um, and so these are going to be common books. You may even have them on your bookshelf, or you can certainly go to the library and pick up the book. Next. Now let's talk a little bit about uh, some of the other things. These are huge conversation starters. Um, that parents can, uh, families can have. Um, they're very common, paying bills, paying with a credit card. Um, a lot of people will say, you know, my child says, well, if I say I don't have money, they just say, well, put it on the card. Um, kids need to understand what that means. Buying a car, getting a pet, moving to a new home, these are all um, guidance that we have out there on how to have this conversation. Um, so, so the children and the family come together uh, for joint understanding. Next. We also encourage, we partner with a number of federal agencies and so we encourage um, exploring other um, agencies. For example, um, we're all dealing with uh, today maybe some uh, remnants of the hurricane or some inclement weather. Uh, what happens if your house is, is damaged? Who do you go to? Obviously, that's FEMA. Um, and so just really researching our other federal agency and federal partners is important as well. Next. This is one of uh, two activities that I'll show you today, and then I'll show you where to find those. So saving for a rainy day. This is a, one of our K through 12 activities. Um, it explores 
um, the importance of saving for unexpected expenses. Um, for children, they can draw pictures of what their rainy day savings could pay for so that you understand that they get an understanding of what an emergency is versus an everyday expense. Um, students are then asked to think of two or three, two to five unexpected expenses that you might have to pull money from that emergency savings to, to pay. And then they'll draw a picture representing those expenses on the student worksheet, which is provided. Start Small, Save Up is an initiative of the, of the Bureau. And what it is designed to do is to encourage people not to think of that huge pile of money that they're wanting to put back, but really just start small. Find expenses that you can cut that you can then transfer even if it's $5 um, to start out, but start putting money aside, um, even if it's just small amounts that you can find within your budget. Next slide. The next is creating a monthly household budget. Um, regardless, we all have to abide by some form of budget. Now it can be written, it can be uh, in our heads, but really getting um, a household budget down on paper allows for the entire family to kind of talk through it. In this activity, students determine how to balance their needs and wants, uh, which is again, very important for children to uh, be able to distinguish a bit uh, a between. And then they'll review budgeting scenario, um, help them build a budget using a fillable PDF. Um, we give them an income and they walk through making decisions on housing, eating out, internet, pets, uh, just our basic everyday expenses. Next slide. Here is where you can find our youth financial literacy activities. There are 250 activities um, out in, in the searchable database. And uh, for those of you that are going, oh my gosh, 250. That's why it's searchable. Uh, you can search certainly by topic. Uh, you can search by student characteristic. Um, I just did a conference where, where a special education teacher asked me, well, is there anything out there for us? Yes, they're under um, student characteristics. You can, um, you can find activities that fit almost any classroom. They're also not intended just for personal finance classes. Uh, we know there's a lot of curricula out there, but we also know that only 20 states have a mandate, mandate uh, for financial literacy uh, to graduate. So what we chose to do was create activities um, that can be integrated into art, PE, uh, career and technical education, uh, if you're teaching a math class, you can uh, you can search by math. You can search by English over here in the in the left hand side. Next slide. Our money monster stories are five stories that are um, cover a topic, and they are in part of our elementary education series, our K through. Uh, five, but they are included in the, the resource I just showed you. Uh, there are activities that can be provided with these books um, that can be pulled down and used with these books to enhance learning. Um, although the money monsters themselves are just cute as a bug, uh, we have these either for order or you can use EPUB. Uh, the EPUBs are, um, I think, in the next couple of weeks will be somewhat animated so you, they'll be a little more fun to look at than just a pdf um, but however you can order classroom sets um, next slide please and here uh, this is my final slide as our cfpb publications and on here you can order sets of the money monsters you can order sets of the parent guides you also can order bookmarks, posters for a classroom, posters for uh, your parent center. And all of those are free. It's like going to, to a big box store 
picking all your goodies, getting to the pay, and you don't owe anything, and that ships to you for free. Um, and I will turn it over. Next slide, please. I'll turn it over to our Office of Students. Thanks, Lynn. This is Kate Mullen. I think my video is, there we go, come, slowly coming on. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me today. I'm from the Office for Students and Young Consumers. Uh, we work to engage students before, during, and after pursuing higher education. Um, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Great, so as part of consumer education, we are seeking to prevent harm. And for students and young consumers, uh, one of our big goals is to prevent student loan defaults, uh, which can obviously have big consequences for someone's financial future, their, their credit score, and um, they can end up um, you know, affecting, uh, you know, collections can come after them, all kinds of things. So we will obviously wanna help avoid that. Next slide, please. We have a whole bunch of resources, um, including a mailing list, again, the bulk printing that Lynn just mentioned. All these links are here, many resources in other languages. Next slide, please. We also have a new podcast out. Um, this is meant for, uh, for students to listen to. We bring in people to interview. Um, often they're experts, but sometimes they're just students who are experiencing their own um, or sharing their own experiences, excuse me. So that's something to share. Next slide, please. Okay, and so I'm gonna spend the, the rest of the presentation focusing on federal tools specifically for preparing to go to college um, and that planning process. Um, and the reason is this is one of, you know, for most college students, this is going to be the first and also the most complex financial situation that they'll perhaps ever be in. Um, there's lots of different sources for money. It's not like you just have one job and, and that's where all your money comes from. There's lots of different sources they're trying to juggle and then lots of different expenses. Um, and it's not just like when you're you know, self-sufficient and living on your own and paying monthly bills. They have these lump amounts that are due for tuition and, and club fees and building a work wardrobe and all this stuff. So um, it's just, it's a, it's a very, uh, uh, it's a pretty wild financial situation to try and manage. Next slide, please. And what we're seeing is high rates of distress among student loan borrowers. So going back to what I mentioned earlier about trying to prevent default, um, we are seeing much more so than in other um, debt products such as credit cards or mortgages, auto loans, um, much higher rates of late payments, um, which are obviously an indicator that someone's struggling to, to stay out of default, um, high rates of concern that they won't be able to pay off their, their loans, and over half uh, in this particular study did not calculate their monthly student loan payment before they took it out. So um, they they signed for the debt and just and didn't have a clear picture of what it was going to mean for them financially going forward. Next slide, please. So we're hoping that more planning upfront would will help. Um, and I want to make a plug. You know, saving is great. Um, in an ideal world, we'd all be able to start saving for our children's education early in their lives. That's not realistic for all families, of course. Um, but we do want to make a plug that it's it's never too late to start saving, even if your kid is already in high school, even if they're late in high school. Um, every every dollar in in the moment might not seem that that extra dollar is not, is going to go very far. But when you think about it in terms of that dollar, if they if it's not saved for, is going to be replaced with a loan that dollar is worth $2 in repayment. Um, and that's on average due to interest and capitalization and the, the length of time that people spend repaying their loans. It costs on average $2 to repay every $1 that is borrowed. Um, so those, those contributions from saving, if you're budgeting out of your income, can go farther than you realize. Next slide, please. I also though want to mention um, other options for helping your child afford college that have nothing to do with giving them money. Um, a big one is uh, providing information that they need for the FAFSA, for the federal application for federal student aid, free application for federal student aid. Um, if you can help them research grant and scholarship opportunities, um, if you can inquire with your employer about tuition assistance, share with them your financial habits if you have cost-cutting strategies, um, because cutting costs is a great way to reduce the amount of student debt. Um, if you can apply for a federal 
parent post loan. Um, and I just want to mention also that um, if you apply uh, and are denied, the student then has more access to direct unsubsidized loans, um, which is going to be at a lower interest rate and with additional protections than a private student loan. So that is a strategy that some that some families pursue. And then once they're in school, um, if you can, you know, if they can live at home, if that makes sense, um, and then encouraging them to really maximize their, their college experience, not just by getting great grades and learning a lot in class, although of course that's important, um, but but putting, laying a foundation for their career by building relationships, relationships, excuse me, through volunteer work or just work work, um, participation in clubs and activities, and uh, building again those relationships with their academic advisor, financial aid, the professors by going to office hours, and their fellow classmates. Um, all of that, it doesn't sound like that's, you know, putting in, um, that's, you know, a financial strategy, but in the long run, it can be. Um, because those relationships can translate into additional scholarship opportunities or work opportunities. Um, and just we just encourage you to be upfront about your financial limits with your student. Um, it's a very difficult conversation to have between a, a parent and child about what kind of resources are available from the family for uh, paying for college. And the more upfront you can be, the better they can plan. Um, and we certainly don't want you to go beyond what is actually financially healthy for you, because as our colleagues in the Office for Older Americans like to say, there are no scholarships for retirement. Next slide, please. Okay, so the, the tool that I'm going to show you today comes in after a student has already applied, been accepted, gotten their financial aid offers, and is trying to make those final decisions. Next slide, please. And we did a bunch of research um, by looking at, for instance, uh, work that other people have done to uh, analyze financial aid offers and see what was confusing about them. Um, people very typically were confused by the jargon, by the inconsistent calculations. If you've already gone through this process with a child in your family or for yourself, you know that each letter can look very different from letter to letter. Um, and they all use their own abbreviations and the way their own formatting, it can be very difficult to interpret exactly what they mean. Next slide, please. We also talked to many students um, from a variety of backgrounds, and they were very consistently clear that they care a lot about financial fit, um, and they want help making informed decisions about paying for college. Um, so they're looking for that guidance from their parents, teachers, counselors, any other organizations they might be involved in, they are certainly aware that this is a complex decision and they want help. Next slide, please. Oh no, there we go. Uh, and when we talked to parents and advisors, they mirrored, mirrored those concerns. Uh, they don't want to crush their children's dreams, but they also don't want their children to end up in crushing debt. And that, and that may sound familiar to you. Next slide, please. Okay, so the tool I'm going to show you now lives on our website. It's at consumerfinance.gov slash gradpass. So if you want to go ahead, oh, can you go to the previous slide, please? Um, if you want to go ahead and, and check that out, um, you can. And here, I'll actually put it in the chat as well. And in the meantime, if you could, um, if you could pass the, if you can make it so that I can present, please. I'm going to go ahead and show the tool itself. Thank you. All right. So when you get to the tool, it'll actually look a little different. Here, I'll show. If you go to that grad pass link that I mentioned, it'll look like this when you first show up. And you'll hit start. And I have some stuff that are pre-filled. So you'll start by putting a bunch of information into the tool. So again, this is when you've, you've gotten the financial aid offer and you're trying to figure out if it's the right fit for your family, right fit for your student. So you're gonna tell them about the school and the program that you wanna do. You're gonna put in the costs that are hopefully included in the offer letter. And if not, you'll have to ask the school. Um, it's really important to have a clear picture of the cost because they drive everything about financial aid. And in this case, um, I've entered a bunch of information already, so the cost not yet covered. I already can see up front that I, I have 1,800 bucks I need to cover. So each of the, the pages here will take you through the different types of funding. Um, you'll be able to manipulate these and change them as needed. They also have additional information at the bottom that came from those interviews with students, parents, and advisors. Um, 
money saving strategies that go with grants and scholarships as well as pitfalls to watch out for or scholarships, whatever the case might be. So that's what this first section is about. Then we look at how can I actually get those costs covered? Um, so this allows you to revisit everything. And in this case, I'm just going to uh, zero it out by cutting some of my costs here. And now we can see that all my costs are covered. This is also where you can learn about Parent PLUS loans and private student loans. Okay, and then this next session, this is where the tool really starts to give you additional information. Sorry about that. Um, a lot of students have asked us, how do I know if I'm getting into too much debt? And so the guideline that we recommend following is that your total debt at graduation should be less than the salary that you expect to make coming out of school. So we help calculate that here. We make some broad assumptions about your borrowing. And we bring in some data from College Scorecard, and we show that, in this case, uh, the, the total debt ends up being less than that median salary. Um, so this, this is um, ostensibly an affordable amount of debt. We'll also show you the total amount of interest that you'll pay. We want students to understand it's not just the money that you're borrowing, it's also the interest. And then we can also look at affordability. You know, we look at a big picture gut check. We can also look at it in terms of the monthly payment. So we look at the monthly payment. If I'm making 15 bucks an hour, how many hours is it going to take to cover that payment? So then get a sense of, can I realistically cover that? And then we can also look at it in terms of a monthly budget. So we have some average spending at that salary range in different parts of the country. And they can use this to check out, and all of this is editable. So if they know, actually, you know, I'm I'm going to be living somewhere much more expensive, whatever, they can go ahead and and double check that they can actually afford this monthly payment going forward. Okay, just because you can buy something doesn't mean you should. So we show you some um, some very narrow, specific metrics about the school, focusing on that financial payoff of the investment that the student and the family are making into going to college. So first we look at the graduation rate because you, you need to graduate obviously in order to get um, the salary boost from having that degree. And in this case, uh, we try to give you a sense of, of whether that's relatively high or not. Um, and you can do a, na a nationwide comparison or statewide or compared to other public. We also look at the loan default rate and the loan repayment rate. Um, so again, just focusing very specifically, not on all the different benefits you can derive from college, but very specifically on the financial payoff. Then you get a chance to review all the numbers you've seen so far. And if you're feeling good about the plan based on that review, here are some next steps to consider. Everything from the paperwork, healthy financial habits like making a budget. Um, again, a push to build that relationship with the financial aid office. And then thinking very carefully about your academic planning, your academic advising, because that is financial planning and financial advising for, for a college student where you are paying by the credit. Um, and, and the longer it takes to graduate, the more credits you have to pay for, the more those credits cost, the more the whole um, degree is going to cost. If they're feeling less confident, we have some other options to consider as well, um, such as cutting their costs, again, getting more credits from a more affordable school, all the way down to exploring other schools. And so I, I would want to make a plug here too, if um, we, the best thing that a student can do to set themselves up to have good options is to apply to more than one school. Um, that's kind of your, your first bottleneck. If you only apply to one school, then you get the deal that you get. Um, just like you would comparison shop for sneakers or a car or a house, we want you to do the same for colleges. And the only way to do that is to apply to more than one. Um, because you, you never know you know, that, that upfront sticker price, that tuition that's listed on the website, that's their average, that's their guess. But, but really financial aid, um, as well as, you know, the, the, the net cost that a school presents to you is going to vary so much student to student based not only on um, that student's individual achievements, but also how they complement the student body as a whole. It all just, it depends so greatly on, on all those individual factors that we, it's, you know, the only way you know how much a school is actually going to cost you is to actually apply. And at the end, uh, you get this link. And, and the thing that's great about this link is it actually captures all of the information that I put into the tool. So all of the, the loans, the grants, the scholarships that I captured, that I typed in here are captured. 
Um, and so that way you can take this, hold on to it, email it to yourself, um, come back to it as many times as you want as the student gets more information about their financial situation and they can revise their plan. And that way they, they have that ability to come back and revisit it. Um, it can be a living document, but they're not creating an account. It's not associated with your, uh, with your email address or any personal information like that. Um, so it, sh it should be a more private, more secure way to, to get this planning done and to be able to hold on to the results that it's giving you. Okay, and then let me Yay, great. Um, and so then the final the final piece of information that I'll share is that we are working right now on a version of that tool or, or a sister tool really um, for families that would help relatives, parents, grandparents, other relatives plan um, how much and in what ways they want to contribute to their students' education. So we're working on that now. We'll be looking to get uh, to um, get input on that. So if there's any interest in uh, giving us your your input, um, please contact me. I'll put my my contact info in the chat. Okay, and now I'll hand it over. There we go. There's my contact information right there. Thank you so much. Now over to Jill. Okay, thank you. And I hope my sound is okay. I'm really excited to be with everyone today and hope this full range of Bureau resources has been helpful to you. I'm Jill Wheeler and I lead uh, the program called Your Money, Your Goals in the Office of Community Affairs. So the Community Affairs section is focused on serving populations who might lack full and affordable access to financial services. It includes uh, individuals and families with low to moderate incomes or low wealth. And in general, we, we serve people who are financially vulnerable. And in these, the current context, this, um, the number of families that are included in this category is certainly a significant share of the, the population. So we're looking at ways that our tools can be useful in serving people who have been struggling with finances for a long period of time and may be very important and useful as you encounter families who may be newly vulnerable or in, a, in an unusually fragile financial position. Uh, next slide, please. And I will share in the chat a link that is on this slide to the Your Money, Your Goals set of educational tools and resources. So the Your Money, Your Goals program is, was designed and tested and developed explicitly for people like you, practitioners working in the field, serving others, um, families and individuals and families. So we were especially excited to present to you all at the Parent Center. Um, the toolkit, it, there are, this slide highlights several resources that are part of the Your Money, Your, Your Goal suite of materials. If you click on the website in the bottom left, so consumerfinance.gov slash practitioner resources slash Your Money, Your Goals, you'll see a variety of materials that include the toolkit, which is a, over 200 pages. Uh, you could print it out. All, or all of these materials are available to order for free online. You can just click on a link. They generally come in batches of 25 to 50. Uh, so you can order a set for you and your colleagues or others um, to use with the people you serve. They're also available online. And as we, over time, have added more digital tools, downloadable pieces, we're finding in the current context when people are working and serving others virtually, these digital tools can be particularly helpful. So I will get into a few examples from the toolkit from our online resources. I want to highlight here on the bottom left a set of colorful issue-focused booklets. So these are really action-oriented print materials that are very helpful to use one-on-one -on -one to sit down with someone if they're ready to get into the details of certain financial issues and work through them, especially if you see people multiple times or meet with people on a regular basis. 
And then finally, we have a set of companion guides that have special tools and additional information and use examples that are particularly relevant to certain special populations, including native communities, uh, reentry or people with criminal records, and people with disabilities. So I will be highlighting some examples from a few of these key resources. So if you could go to the next slide, please. And one um, note I want to mention, we are seeing that in this current year, um, as in the past, but especially um, noticeable this year, we recognize that many of these financial concerns and questions are not only to provide information to the people that you serve, but that many practitioners and many of us are experiencing a lot of financial challenges as well. So one thing that I want to highlight is that this set of materials is designed for people who are not financial experts themselves, but they're for people who often serve as a trusted resource and a trusted source of information in the community who people turn to for advice, information, and this guide, the toolkit, and the re related resources are really, um, we call it a toolkit on purpose, not a curriculum because you don't have to go module by module through each topic. Really, it's a toolkit so you can find the right information at the right time. So as you see someone confronting a financial challenge or someone comes to you with a question and they're looking at uh, where to turn for information, we want you to be able to think of the Bureau, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, as a trusted, objective, credible source of the basic financial information. So in the toolkit itself, we try to cover the full range of financial concerns and questions that many people across the country experience. I'll give you some highlights, the range of topics covered in the modules. There's an introductory section that includes a couple assessments and starting points. So one assessment is an assessment for providers or practitioners, case managers, the people that, are, that may go out and use this information with the people they serve. This will help you to, to get a sense of what am I most confident about, what are areas where I, want, I might want to increase my knowledge or know where to look as certain topics come up. There's also a money picture tool that I'll show in just a moment. There's a popular module we find is pretty useful on setting goals. So if you're working with a family over a period of time, there may be a point when you're setting goals with them on a range of topics. It might be dealing with their child's education, their child's future, but often money issues come into this goal setting piece. So you'll find some tools in that module on goal setting. There's a section on saving and saving for emergencies, even when times are tight. Uh, and we are seeing, although many people are in an urgent crisis, others have been sort of newly reminded of the importance of saving for an emergency. So for certain people, that may be something on their mind. It's not something everyone can tackle right now, but it's a resource for you. We have a module on tracking income and benefits and I'll show a couple of those tools. So here it's, it's from um, examples range from tracking benefits and income to looking at ways to get paid. More and more these days, people may, may be having choices about do they get their paycheck through direct deposit or is it coming to them now on a prepaid card? How can they maximize the resources, minimize the fees involved and make a choice that fits best for them? Other modules are on paying bills, the general flow, um, and I'll cover a couple of those. There's one on cutting expenses that can be helpful. You and many others may have many strategies in mind already, but as people are very stressed and maybe have so much on their mind, turning to a resource of checklists can help prompt ideas that you can discuss with others. And then getting through the month, I'll show a tool briefly to cover that concern. And if we could go on to the next slide. And as we talk this through, I do want to mention that one um, observation we've had throughout our work 
is that often the most effective financial educators or the people who can really have an impact in changing people's lives, helping them reach some of their goals, are people who have gone through many of those same challenges themselves. So as you think about how could I use this with the parents or families or others I'm working with, or even with family members, um, we often see that as people are willing to share a bit of their own story or their own experience, that can really open up, and I imagine you all are very experienced in this, in building some rapport and trust to be able to dive into these really um, sensitive financial conversations. So continuing on the toolkit, you'll see we have a module on debt, which can be very important these days, um, planning to pay down debt, tools for comparing different types of loans. Uh, this connects with the great resources that Kate just shared for students and college loans. Um, we have a module on understanding credit reports and scores. And this can be very important as people make decisions on which bills to pay, when t funds are tight, this can have a very important long-term impact. So I would encourage you, in addition to the resources that I cover, if you have questions about credit, the Bureau has a number of great web pages around credit issues that we're seeing are, are a very popular topic these days. We have a section on choosing financial products and services helping people to make sure they understand the full range of options, whether it's selecting the right type of bank account or understanding the difference between pros and cons of a credit union, a standard bank account, or other financial options. Um, again, laying it out. And the focus of all of these in the Bureau's approach is to be objective and unbiased, to help people really lay out the information so they can have the information on hand to make the decision that best meets their own needs, values, and priorities. And then a final topic that I'll mention is protecting your money. So looking at ways to protect identity, handle identity theft or scams if those come up, um, spot red flags, and I'll touch on our complaint function. So if we could move to the next slide, please. I wanted to give a quick overview of the what we call the booklets. These are colorful, um, small, the size of a paperback book or, or notepad with a spiral binding. These are really designed with sort of a workbook approach. So our the topics covered in the toolkit are available for download. You can download individual tools, fill them out online. A lot of them will auto-calculate. You can plug in the information. It'll calculate. You can save or print them out. Um, but this set of resources is best used in print, uh, in person with the people you serve. So we have some specialized sort of select sets of topics, one on bill paying, which is in English and Spanish, uh, issues related to bills, one on debt, one on credit, which is also available in English and Spanish, another booklet on building your savings and savings for emergency, saving for emergencies, and then we have specially formatted copies for use in correctional facilities that are useful for some audiences. Could we go to the next slide, please? To give a quick example of one of the tools that we find useful in just starting the conversation. We recognize some people love to jump in, feel confident, and get excited talking about money issues. Others are very uncomfortable. It's a difficult and delicate conversation. So we have a couple tools that are simple, you know, a 10 question checklist that you can go through and just start the conversation. Get a sense of what are the areas that people may be feeling okay about? Where are there areas of greatest stress? Where are the areas of highest need that you could help take action and help them find the information or resources to help be, help address? So depending on what they select um, in terms of topics, and I know this writing is a little small, but questions like, do you have dreams for your children that need, um, that involve money? Um, or, you know, have, has your credit history posed a barrier to you in um, achieving some of your goals? This will help you turn to the right section for information to address those topics. Next slide, please. 
So the tool, the income and benefits tracker is a standard, very common tool that you may see, have seen in other settings. Again, this is available to download or fill out online if you're working with someone in a virtual context. And here I want to highlight a couple features. One is recognizing that people may have a couple different jobs, so they may put in income from a few different sources. It helps them track uh, resources that may be coming in from child support, disability benefits, SNAP, TANF, or other government programs. I would mention we are seeing providers say that some of their clients have been very familiar. They have used government benefits in the past. They have a sense of how they work and how the timing works. Other families may be accessing these resources for the first time and trying to understand what the restrictions are, what the timing is. So this is a, a sheet you can walk through and help people lay out um, all their options, including their cash income. Um, there's a little box here to highlight and make the distinction between what is the net income that they have available after taxes uh, and what are other resources that may not be used like cash. They may be only able to cover food or certain expenses and look at which weeks of the month they may become available and help identify areas when time will be especially tight. Uh, next slide, please. The next slide will be an expense tracker. And I, I see my screen is off sync, but I hope my audio is still working. So I'll continue on to describe the expense tracker. Um, and one feature in the tracker is, um, and I'll ask someone to just interrupt if you're not, if you're not, uh, it's not synced up with the slides. But on the expense tracker, you'll notice we have a whole list of categories. And the first one on the slide is cell phone, along with several other expenses. In the training sessions that we provide, we often ask, why do you think cell phone was listed as the first expense on this slide? And the answer is simply that we did this in alphabetical order. So just to emphasize, these tools are not placing a value judgment on which expenses are more important or are better or worse in some way. It's really to emphasize, uh, and there's no right decision, but that we hope people will have all the information laid out in front of them so they can make a good decision for themselves based on having all the information at hand. And this is where we find as people think about their expenses, it, they might not think of certain things that they really consider essential or that come up every month or that they have to factor into the budget uh, to make ends meet. And so there are different strategies for you know, reviewing financial habits, tracking spending, uh, but this is a popular tool that, uh, if we can go on to the next slide, uh, can be combined with our cash flow budget. So as people may be, um, have traditionally experienced a building a monthly budget, what we often see is that people are in reality living week to week and dealing with what money do they have left at the end of the week. So by laying out the dates and the timing, the cash flow budget really helps people look at what is my starting balance this week, plug in the different resources, income and other benefits they receive, subtract expenses, and really begin preparing to look at where are the shortfalls, where do I have a little more, what are the week, best weeks to pay my bills. And, and that can help people plan that way. And I would mention, especially in the COVID context, that you can remind people, sometimes people may not think about adjusting the timing of their bills, and some certain companies and providers are offering some flexibility to just adjust the payment date or split into two smaller payments. So that can ease the fluctuations in cash flow over time. Next slide, please. And just a quick example of one of the tools from the booklet that we find is very popular these days. As people, um, if money is tight, need to prioritize bills, 
This is a tool that helps people walk through and understand what might happen if they don't pay certain bills or fall behind on certain obligations. It can help them assess the trade-offs and make a plan to decide which bills are most important to pay this month. Next uh, slide, please. And on the Bureau website, you'll see a brief video that captures some of that information. We're trying to make more of this available in sort of bite-sized pieces and in different formats for delivery. Uh, and this is an example of sort of a checklist to get people thinking, what are things that I need? What are the risks if I lose my transportation or if I don't pay my insurance or other obligations, child support or court fees, court obligations, and then helping them just to walk through and prioritize. Next slide, please. And can we go to the, oh, the next slide is just an example of the referral sources. Uh, as, as you know, um, I think we all value the ability to connect people with good, credible, accurate resources. So here are some sort of pre-screened many government sources, um, national hotlines and information, and we encourage you to have local referrals on hand as well. Finally, a quick overview of topics in the credit booklet and showing the range of, you know, taking the first steps of reviewing and checking for errors in credit reports. Um, the blue and green section, looking at more long-term planning pieces of building good credit improving credit scores and just making decisions on is it a good idea to use credit for this right now and then red can be used uh, for those immediate challenges and needs where can i turn for help um, on immediate needs next slide please and then finally the guide uh companion guide for people with disabilities this complements the toolkit and if you go to the next slide you'll see the details of the tools. Uh, this highlights a couple examples that may be particularly helpful for families who have a person with a disability. There's some specialized tools around helping pay for assistive devices, one around ABLE accounts and tax advantage savings accounts for disability-related expenses, and one that's been very popular is an SSI estimator that helps people look at if they work, what would the effect be on their SSI benefits? And I want to go ahead and wrap up. If you could go on to the next slide on complaints, will be our final slide. Um, and I'll plug the address again in the chat function and our email to connect with our team is on a final slide. Um, but before I wrap up, I did want to highlight uh, an important function of the Bureau which is responding to consumer complaints. So our agency is responsible for education and also enforcement. So if companies are violating the law or you've tried to resolve an issue and haven't been able to get resolution through your um, conversations with that company or service provider, you can contact the Bureau to file complaints about financial topics ranging from credit to debt, uh, credit cards, mortgages, vehicle and student loans, a wide range of topics. You'll see there's an online portal in the upper right-hand side of our webpage on all of our web pages at consumerfinance.gov. And you can also call by phone. Um, we'll plug the number in the chat function and, and the call center can take calls in over 180 languages. So now I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Kate Kramer in Older American. Hello everyone. So the Office for Older Americans focuses on helping people age 62 and older. However, many of our resources are valuable for people of any age. So for example, some of our resources are specifically for financial caregivers and several may be useful for parents of children with disabilities. Next slide, please. The first resources I want to share with you today are our Managing Someone Else's Money Guides. These guides have information on keeping good records, keeping finances separate, and many other important pieces of being a financial caregiver. These might be useful for parents who are helping to manage finances for an adult child with a disability, for example, as a guardian. So we offer guides for four common types of financial caregivers, agents under a power of attorney, guardians and conservators, trustees, and social security rep payees and Department of Veterans Affairs fiduciaries. 
We have six state-specific guides, which are Georgia, Florida, Illinois, Arizona, Oregon, and Virginia. But if you do not live in one of those states, CFPB also provides a tips and templates guide that you can use to adapt the guides for your own state. And we also have opportunities for co-branding if you're part of an organization that would like to look into that option. These are available in both English and Spanish. And like the vast majority of the resources we're sharing with you today, you can order them in bulk for free from our website or order a single copy if you prefer. Next slide, please. The second group of resources are our fraud prevention placemats, handouts, and activity sheets. We very recently released a new suite of these materials that has bookmarks and table tents as well. So we originally designed these to use uh, to be used by meal delivery programs, but they can be used by community groups or individuals in a lot of different ways. So you can order these in bulk, you can distribute them in your community or hand them out at a luncheon or another event. And these include activities like crossword puzzles, word finds, and other interactive ways to teach people about common scams. Our companion resources that go along with these also have tips on ways to start a discussion about these important issues, which can be very helpful for people of any age. Next slide, please. We also have consumer advisors on our website that cover the topics you can see here on this slide, as well as many more. Again, you can order these and hand them out at events, such as information fairs, luncheons, or any type of event. Next, I'd like to share some information about some resources related to the pandemic. So this is not a resource specifically from the Office of Older Americans, but is a resource from all different divisions and offices within the CFPB. This is a central coronavirus hub that we have created with resources to help consumers protect and manage their finances. Again, these are available in English and Spanish, as well as many other languages. There are also on this website federal coronavirus resources from other government agencies. So there is just a plethora of knowledge here on this website if you'd like to go check it out. We also released a unified housing website with a couple of other federal agencies, which provides consumers with mortgage and housing assistance during the national emergency. This has been used by many, many consumers over the past several months. And we're updating these pages regularly with new changes, so it's important to check back for updates. Next slide, please. So the content on our page has tons of different topics and resources that can help people during the financial uncertainty of the pandemic. You can see some here, and I think many of them may be helpful for the families that you serve. Some have current information on credit and debt management, student loan repayment, mortgage relief options, a guide to COVID-19 economic stimulus relief. And I'd like to highlight just a few of them in the next slide, um, particularly some information about online and mobile banking tips. This has just been something that we have heard for consumers that they have been using more and more and more. Many people who have not used online or mobile banking services are now starting with them due to the lockdowns and social distancing guidelines that may have prevented them from going to their bank or credit union in person. A big piece of this is learning to protect yourself from scams while you're using this new technology. So some tips that you can share with parents and families include being sure to create strong passwords, not using the same password for all accounts. I know some of us are guilty of this, I have been, uh, but that's a good tip to follow not including personal information in their passwords, such as their address or a favorite pet or birthday. And one way to monitor an account is by setting up automatic alerts. So for example, someone could set up an alert that's sent to them when direct deposit is received or a large payment is charged or a balance falls below a certain amount, maybe when your account is in overdraft. Some financial institutions will let you set up an automatic alert when any transaction occurs. So that way people can know right away if there's a fraudulent transaction on their account and they can then report it to the bank or credit union. This can help stay informed without having to log into your account several times a day to check. So parents can check with their bank or credit union to learn more about additional protections that they may offer, such as the ability to inactivate a debit card if fraud is suspected. Next slide, please. And if you're helping someone who wants to bank in person, you can encourage them to call or go online first to check whether their branch might be closed or offering special hours for older customers or members. Maybe they're offering services in person by appointment only or serving people through drive-through windows only. 
If someone runs into an issue and needs specific help, they can contact their bank or credit union directly. Customer service associates are available now often by online chat, by video, as well as by phone. And those um, financial institution staff can help set up the online account, they can answer questions, and they can help parents figure out what they can or cannot do online or through the financial institutions app. Next slide, please. The last piece I wanna talk about are the person-to-person -person mobile payment services. So these have also become part of everyday life for millions of people all of a sudden due to the pandemic. These are apps or services that let you send money to people without having to write a check or hand over cash. These services have become increasingly popular for sometimes small dollar items like paying a friend back for lunch, splitting the cost of rent perhaps, or collecting money for a thank you gift for a child's coach. So you may get questions about using these apps from the people you work with. So here are a few safety tips you can share. Scammers love these services because they try to trick people into sending money or sometimes sending an item, merchandise, without holding up their end of the deal. For example, someone might, probably not during the pandemic, but they could sell you a concert ticket, a sports ticket, something like that, and then never actually give it to you. Or they might purchase something from you, pretend to send a payment, and then cancel it before it reaches your bank account. So the best way to protect your money is to use these services only with family, friends, or other people you know and trust. Most of these apps let you set up a password or a PIN or a fingerprint that you can use to authenticate yourself before you make a payment. Setting that up really helps to prevent anyone else who gets access to your mobile device from making a payment. So if you're sending money to someone for the first time, you can also ask that they send a request to you if that service is available. That helps make sure that you're sending the money to the right person for the right amount. And sometimes if they don't have that request function, you could send a small test payment to make sure it's going to the right person before you send a large amount. Most important is to always double check the amount you entered and the person you selected to pay. I wanna leave a couple minutes for you for questions. So next slide, please. This is information about how to contact us. Next slide. You can download this um, from the PowerPoint. So you can also join our mailing list to get more information from us. So you can find that at these websites and you can contact us as well with any questions. Next slide, please. This is where you'll find us on social media. So please follow us to get updates about new information and resources. Feel free to reach out to us anytime. And thank you all very much for your attention today. Miriam and Lisa, I'm going to turn it back to you to see if there are any questions. We had a few questions, but they mostly related to, can you hear me? Um, mostly related to whether we are going to email when uh, this uh, presentation, when it's recorded um, to you all. And we just want, to, I answered that one um, in, the, in the answer box that yes, we will archive it on the SIPR website and uh, the materials and the handouts on the, that are listed there uh, on, on your panel, um, you can, participants are free to download those uh, right now, but we'll, once we have the recording up, uh, we'll let you all know. And um, certainly comments like, great presentations, and I think that is so true. Uh, th this was just remarkable. Um, you guys are very, very busy. One one question was uh, whether or not we would collect the information out of the chat and make that public. And typically you can see it when you look at the archive, um, but all of these um, addresses and website URLs that are in the chat box are in the PowerPoint um, presentation. So all that information is readily available. And uh, a lot of people just commenting on um, how terrific this was. This was very good. Uh, it's an impressive amount of resources you make available. Deborah, you have anything you want to say, Miriam? Um, I'll just say thank you so much to our presenters. As Lisa said, this was just a wealth of information. 
I learned a lot for myself personally, and I cannot wait to share this information throughout our network as well as with um, families, um, including including my own family. Um, so for those of you who um, have any feedback, definitely share it with us. And we have a survey that we would like for you to complete about the webinar, about and also about other resources that you would be interested in receiving, uh, particularly on this topic. Uh, thanks so much to our tech staff that you guys did an awesome job. I don't want to ever forget that um, the support that you provide to us. And also thank you, Carmen Sanchez, for bringing this excellent presentation to the Parent Center Network. Thanks, everyone, and um, have a great afternoon.